Hi guys, we've been traveling for 12 months now, uh, so it's about time we do a bit of an update video on a few of the things that we've done in the last 12 months. So we originally left to travel on the 28th of February 2019 and we've done 12 months it's february of 2020 now we did go a little bit all over the place and we'll, and we'll show you what we did over the 12 months on our map so just a really quick overview of what we've done sort of where we've been in the 12 month period uh, we left northern new south wales in february 2019 uh, we had already booked our trip to Tasmania, so we had about three weeks to get down to Melbourne. Then we went across to Tasmania for about two months. Uh, from there, we were planning on meeting uh, Steph's family and also going to the Fink Desert Race. So we checked out a little bit of Victoria and then shot across and up into Alice Springs where we also checked out Uluru while we were there. And after that we were originally planning to go do the Kimberley around that time of year it was around June and we thought it would be a good time to go to the Kimberley and then go across into WA. At that time we had been traveling for a few months and there was a few things we weren't really happy with and we wanted to send a bit of stuff home because we did sort of just shove in a fair bit before we left and we didn't really know what we wanted. We also um, had a few things back home um, happening with family members and stuff like that as well. So we decided to head back home. So from Alice Springs, we went across the Plenty Highway, basically just directly towards the East Coast. We went through um, Emerald, we did Aramac um, Sculpture Trail, which was really, really cool. Um, and then we sort of just, yeah, wait, made our way back home. And we had about six weeks at home, a lot longer than we'd planned. I picked up a bit of extra work, which was good. Uh, from home, we actually went sort of west uh, a little bit inland in New South Wales and then headed down to uh, like Bathurst area. After that we had a few things going on at the time so we ended up doing sort of a bit of a loop over towards the east coast and up around Kiama, Batemans Bay, that sort of area. Um, looped back inland and then uh, shot down to Melbourne uh, we were in Melbourne for a little bit just with a, a couple of weeks in a house sit um, and then after that we just explored around Victoria a bit more um, and from from there we sort of worked our way to uh, the start of the Great Ocean Road and started heading west along the Great Ocean Road uh, towards South Australia. Over Christmas, New Year, we secured a house sit in Hindmarsh Island, which was really great. We had that for a few weeks and it was great to get away from um, all the busy areas and the expensive rates over the holidays. So we checked out a lot more of South Australia, worked our way off over towards Anullabor, um, the penin peninsulas and things like that. Then we um, from Sejuna went all across the Nullarbor and then down to Esperance. Um, we just basically followed the coast around uh, from Esperance all the way around to near Busselton and did a little bit more of a loop inland towards Kalgoorlie. We've had a little bit of time around Perth and we're near Perth at the moment, just about an out, uh, hour outside of Perth. So our 12 month anniversary of traveling um, basically from home we've ended up here in Perth and we're spending a little bit of time around here and Chris's family will be flying over in the next couple of days for a week so that'll be really nice. So I suppose it's probably good to talk about what we have experienced so far and how we feel the trip's gone and if it was what we expected and how we've enjoyed it and all of that sort of stuff because for us it was a really big change we we're working full-time and we had a 
our own home like we're paying off our mortgage and we were just sort of ingrained in the area we were living in and to go from that selling everything quitting our jobs renting out our house and traveling full-time was quite out of our comfort zone so we didn't really know what to expect i feel like the biggest thing that we've got out of this is just that freedom so we were planning it for a while and we saved for a fair while before we left which meant it was like a goal of ours for for a fairly long time and we were looking forward to it for a fair, fairly long time working hard and saving so that when we did leave our jobs and start traveling we could enjoy our time and not have to worry too much about working and just enjoy that freedom and that has probably been one of the best feelings to be able to feel like you're actually saving for and you've created this little bubble of um, money that sort of keeps you away from having to sort of worry too much about how much things are costing. We just saved as much as we could and we knew that we were needing to expect things to go wrong, expect things to be expensive, um, have things happen that were out of the blue that we couldn't control and so because we expected those things it wasn't such a drama when they happened yeah the freedom for us was was probably one of the the main things um other than that i feel like we've gotten a lot closer as a couple we obviously have spent basically a full year together like every minute really and we get along really well and i feel like it's just it made it that much better for us in our relationship. We understand each other more and we've been able to have so much more conversation time and actually figure out what we want, the things that are important to us and how we want our life to be moving forward. I think the biggest part of that is obviously we were really close before um, the trip and had a lot of the same ideas and values and stuff, but what you're doing day to day can sort of distract you a fair bit like I think um, just having the time and the freedom to really work out what you do and don't want in life really um, and the things that make you happy the things that annoy you and stuff like that it can just make you really focus on what you actually want um, when it when you're deep into a job and you're working a lot and you a lot of mental and physical effort goes into that it's hard to really pull back and assess what you want um, it's pretty easy when you're doing that to just think well I don't want to work anymore and I want to travel Australia but then when you're doing that it's good to work out what can make you happy going forward um, after traveling full-time yeah, and more a bit more travel related, but it does link back to the lifestyle sort of thing is when you do sort of just get away from that and you do have to sort of downsize quite a bit and choose the things that you need, it actually puts into perspective just the things that are really important and the stuff you don't need. We packed up our lives and most of the stuff we have fits into a little garden shed back home. And that was the stuff we chose to keep that we don't have with us and obviously we don't need it because we haven't had it with us for a year but it really does make you look at things a little bit differently and um, also shows you that it is healthy to do things that you sort of strive for even if they're not like the normal thing or people don't really agree with why you're doing it if you feel like that's the thing to do um, it's really nice to be able to actually go out and do it and reap the rewards of your hard work and effort and all that sort of stuff. So mainly more travel related now actually in relation to moving, seeing new things, exploring Australia. We've had such great experiences, we've met some great people, we've seen some really really great areas, places that we wouldn't have even known existed. Places that you sort of just stumble across that aren't super tourist heavy, that we've absolutely just fallen in love with. And honestly, the places that are free, like free camps and stuff, have been some of the places that are, have made, amazed us 
the most mm -hmm. knowing just how beautiful Australia is and that you are able to do that just go out and camp in these beautiful areas like camps in Tassie on lakes all by yourself caught out in the snow um, out in the middle of nowhere like yeah it's just it's just amazing and also just being able to travel your own country so having everything you need knowing the language having your own setup being able to navigate and explore with everything you need is um, really enjoyable a big part of that i think as well is having a good setup to begin with obviously you don't need a really elaborate setup or you know all the latest and greatest but if you've just got the basic stuff like a good solar setup with uh, a dual battery and a fridge and that sort of thing it lets you actually enjoy those places with no services um, so you can go there you can still run all your power you can have everything you need there um, and as Steph said it doesn't have to be a real touristy famous place uh, to be you know some of the nicest parts of the country um, and I'm positive that probably in our top five camps uh, probably four of them were just free camps in um, random spots really it's amazing what you can actually um, get at some of those places and normally just the fact that there's not 20,000 other people there is a huge thing that actually lets you enjoy it a lot more. So we are filming this out while we're camping and we just had the sun move and the shade move so we were starting to row so we've shifted a little bit but leading on from what we were just talking about um, we just wanted to mention a couple of the experiences or memories that have really stuck with us sort of in our last year of travel so one of the main ones for me is um swimming with the dolphin uh, swimming with the dolphins and seals um in south australia at baird bay it was sort of for my 30th birthday and it was like it was absolutely amazing just being in the water with these playful seals just spinning and diving like so quickly around you uh, playing in the water and having my hair eaten while <laughs> while I was freaking out not and you're not allowed to touch them so it's just yeah it was a bit strange but it was a really really cool um, memory that um, the Great Ocean Road flying across the Great Ocean Road um, area, like the Twelve Apostles and stuff like that in a helicopter. That was a really cool experience and it started raining while we were up in the sky. Um, we hadn't been in a helicopter before and it was a really cool spot to actually get up and experience that part of Australia in a bit of a different view. The biggest things for me this year was just uh, we've done a lot of stuff this year with um, people in the truck industry. Uh, we started a new page and stuff like that, just doing videos with them. And just the amount of people we got to meet in a year and some of the things we got to do and see were just stuff I'll never really forget. Um, just having the freedom and the time to be able to do that sort of thing like open yourself up to your hobbies and your interests and um, really make it happen um, it's stuff you can like we could have done it while we were back at work but it's just a lot harder always trying to get time off at the right time and travel and get to these areas so Doing that sort of stuff is a really big highlight for me. Um, pretty much all of it, just getting to actually see the country. Um, I'm 32 now, growing up, I've heard of just about every little town um, and finally seeing towns and cities and stuff that you've only read about or seen photos of is really cool. 
Um, you know, driving across the Nullarbor, a lot of people hate it. I really enjoyed it. Um, seeing the Fink Desert race was amazing. And there's so many little glimpses and memories along the way that we won't really forget. Like um, when we left Fink and went to the Lambert Centre, um, then heading back to the highway, we ended up towing some a carload of backpackers about 80 kilometres on a really corrugated road and just things like that that weren't planned, weren't expected and just happen as as we travelled will stick with us forever I think. Yeah, even like um, in Tassie we did a few tracks and we were by ourselves and you sort of pull up to the track not knowing you know what it's like and all of that, what you're in for and just meeting people that are there at the same time doing the same thing and you know being able to sort of help each other through and do these awesome um, tracks to awesome places mm -hmm. yeah just sort of being living more sort of in the moment and in taking things as they come um, I think that's been a big thing for us we're we're, we're sort of planners and we like to plan and um, just traveling the way we have we don't really do that it you don't you can't really plan too far ahead because if you do then things are going to change anyway so a lot of the time we don't know where we're going to end up on a day we don't know how far we're going to go we we just sort of wing it and it's been it's been a really cool sort of change of pace for us doing that so we've just talked about like the good parts and the, the things that we've really enjoyed and we just wanted to mention a few things that have gone wrong or just things that have been a bit frustrating or annoying doing what we're doing or things that have happened in the last 12 months because um, you know not everything is amazing and perfect and like smooth sailing there's things that happen and sometimes you can just be a bit over it or you know a few things happen in conjunction with each other and you're just not feeling it or just random stuff that you couldn't have even imagined um, happening or if you're picturing traveling around Australia so we just thought we would mention a few that sort of stick with us since we've been traveling uh, one of the first things we'll mention and it's a big one is people so the majority of people out there are awesome and great to meet but there are some people out there with absolutely no idea of how to be a decent human um, there's just been not a huge amount of times but enough to piss you off really <laughs> Like, there'll be times where you're in a camp site, uh, like an open bush camp area, and at midnight, when there's no one else around and there's a big open space, someone will park three metres away from you and set up, and then bang around, make noise. For like two hours. All that sort of shit. Engine and then. To top it all off, when you wake up in the morning and climb down the ladder, they're sitting with their chair facing you, like just staring at you. And they've like, ran their generator all night as well. Yeah, and <laughs> like there's plenty of times we understand like you have to camp close to people and caravan parks and stuff like that. No problem, but some people are just really, really inconsiderate and I don't understand why I don't understand their thought process of doing that like whether they're trying to piss you off or whatever but it has happened a handful of times in the 12 months and it's really hard to not let it piss you off um, we're loving traveling we don't have anywhere to be anywhere to go life's good but those sort of things just baffle my mind. I can't work out why people are so... Ignorant? I ignorant, yeah, that will yeah. do. <laughs> Another example sort of similar to that, um, 
We were camped up near Biwa, sort of like in a car. It was sort of like a caravan park. You had to pay to be in there, and you had your own sites. And we woke up. It was about 7 a.m. And there was like um, a, a gentleman and his son doing like working out. But part of their workout was chopping up and with an axe this huge log that was right next to our camp for like the whole length of however long it takes to chop up a, a log with an axe for aerobics or something and that's 7 a.m right next to you and it was just you just sometimes you just look at each other and you're like is this actually happening like mm. it, you cannot think that like you could not consider ever doing something like that if it was flipped around it's something you would not do to mm -hmm. anybody and makes no sense and um yeah some of the stuff that we've seen is just so random another day we were camped on near a river and it was super early maybe 5 a.m and this car pulled up like right next to us and then they got out all these like buckets and s sand siphoning things and we're just siphoning buckets full of sand right next to our camp and it doesn't seem like it would make a lot of noise but at 5am when there's no other sounds it was quite loud and yeah random things that you just can't really understand one of the other big sort of negative things i suppose uh that affects i guess how you're feeling about the trip is when the weather just does turn to crap um we're pretty happy with the setup um especially with the huge benefit of not having to tow and stuff like that um the biggest single thing that affects us is when the wind is really really bad the tent and everything holds up to the wind fine it's just say you're trying to sleep and there's this constant flapping of the canvas um, but I think the main thing that kind of bothers you is it really limits what you can actually do so say you just want to cook lunch um, it can be a bit of a pain trying to cook in gale force winds that just keep blowing the flame out um, just things like that it's not a big deal it's not a concern and it wouldn't stop stop you from traveling um, it's just something to be aware um, when the weather turns crap yeah having a way around that yeah and the wind um, just makes a huge difference like if it's um, windy and rainy that's one of the hardest parts for us because although we're in the rooftop that does have like a little awning if it's really windy and the rain is coming in at the side um, we've had it, you know if it's raining for a fair few hours it will start seeping into the bedding and then if you've got no sun or anything and you're just sort of hunkered down and then your bedding gets wet <laughs> it's a pretty miserable time <laughs> just all that is is just the canvas getting soaked through for hours yeah um you can't really avoid that next one on the list that gets asked a lot is uh stuff with the car and our setup um breakages and things like that we have had a pretty good run over 12 months there's been a fair few little things um, you know like I think just before we went across to Tassie had a, a split radiator hose um, there was a sensor for our temp gauge just little things like that here and there which weren't a big deal uh, the main way we sort of have tried to do it across our travels is plan to get more little things done at once so when the car's due for a service we'll try and get little fiddly things done at the same time what that can do is then run up and give you a fairly big bill at the service um, 
the first service we did in Victoria um, escalated pretty quick because we got like even door rubbers and stuff like that replaced and um, I think the first repair bill was like three and a half thousand dollars or something like that but there was a lot of stuff on there that wasn't critical you know it was just we planned it that way um, so the next major one would have been um, when we got back over to Queensland Chris had noticed around the time of Fink that one of our airbags that we used to help keep the rear of the car level um, was flat. It was flat, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and we couldn't figure out what was up with it. And um, so we organised somewhere that installs Airbag Man, which is the brand we have, um, to order a new set in for us and do a service at the same time when we got back to Brisbane and they had to have it overnight um, which we weren't expecting so that was an extra extra thing to organize but they had we think that all the corrugations out in, at Fink had um, destroyed the bag so we had to get that whole system replaced. Uh, at the same time with the airbag kit in Brisbane we needed to get new rear brakes um, like uh, discs done because uh, the roads out near Ayers Rock and Fink had done a bit of damage and uh, damaged the rear brake setup. So that again was uh, like a major service so all oils and filters and everything throughout the car plus the airbag kit plus brakes and stuff and I think it ended up being over four thousand dollars that time um, so it's big I guess hits at once but it's up to you how you want to do it if you want to do things as you go or you know get them fixed in one place um, obviously another thing is in remote areas sometimes it can be a lot more expensive to get parts and uh, labor and stuff um, so it's just trying to time up and do it the best way you can yeah and if you're out in the middle of nowhere and something goes wrong and you haven't done any preventative stuff it's a lot it's going to put you out a lot more being out in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. than if you just did get them to check it over and get things fixed when you when you're there the next major one would be when we were back in Victoria and um, it was it wasn't as expensive that time uh, all that was in uh, Victoria was we needed a new pan hard bar and um, a couple of other little things but it didn't add up to all that much I think it was around fifteen hundred dollars or so so really in 12 months uh, for the age of the car and the roads we've been driving and stuff like that it's all nothing was really out of the ordinary um, or unexpected and as Steph said earlier in the video we we budgeted for that kind of stuff um, it always assumes something will go wrong um, but we've been pretty happy like nothing's really caught us off guard or anything like that um, just a few days ago we got a new set of tyres um, we always knew we were going to have to do that in the trip um, so we were pretty happy with the kilometres we got out of them and stuff but it made sense to get them now before we head off away from Perth into more remote areas um, just get them done now and normally a better price as well if you've watched any of our other travel update videos, we have done a couple sort of as we've progressively gone through and we've tracked our accommodation expenses and our fuel, um, how much it's cost us over the year. We haven't tracked anything else. A lot of that is really variable. So we just thought we'd give an idea on like the basic things. So you need fuel and you need accommodation and we haven't done it super cheap we haven't done it as cheap as you 
probably could. There's things in, in there that will go through, um, showing where you could definitely save money. Um, but in fuel, I feel like we've probably done it almost as cheap as we possibly could. We've got the long range tank and we fill up when we see cheaper fuel and plan ahead. So most of the time we've, we've done that as cheap as we can. So we just wanted to let you know the totals for the year for those. So our total fuel cost for the 12 months was $9,432.10. And as we've spoken about, we have been like all like back and forwards and all over the place. So you could probably have done the whole lap in that, do you reckon? Maybe? Yeah, so also we didn't mention at this point now we've done a bit over 50,000 kilometers since we actually left I think 52 yeah, I think or so about that. Yeah. Um, it the if you're just sort of hugging the coast and driving the whole way around Australia I'm pretty sure it's only like 20 to 25,000 kilometers we've done a lot of back and forth and zigging zagging and um, so that's a fair few kilometers really um, in 12 months um, another thing is because of where we've gone there's a pretty big mix there like when we went into um, Alice Springs and stuff and out to Uluru there's some quite expensive fuel there um, the majority of the fuels pretty average price yeah um, but we have had to fill up in remote areas a few times yeah so that's that's what the fuel was and yeah like Chris said if you hugged the coast and were doing like a lap you wouldn't you wouldn't spend that much in fuel no. I wouldn't think and if you have a more economical car or whatever yeah. it'll be cheaper as well so that was that was pretty surprising that figure and if you've got a say a more modern dual cab ute and tow a caravan or camper trailer you'd probably work out it would be a similar kind of cost um, our fuel has really fluctuated on this trip um, I'm, at the start of the trip we were getting consistent 12 to 13 litres per hundred as um, basically as the temperature heated up uh, we went a few months where we were getting pretty bad fuel, like 16 litres per hundred, sometimes 17, uh, in real hot areas, like up through the middle. Um, but really on average, I think we've sort of hovered around that 14 to 15 litres per hundred across the whole trip. Um, so if you were working on something around that figure, um, We've done over 50,000 Ks and um, still under $10,000 for the year, so we're pretty happy with that so far. Yeah, I thought we would have spent more. Mm -hmm. The next uh, figure is for accommodation. So this is for 12 months, including anything to do with accommodation, whether it be a caravan park, campsite fees, um, we've done some Airbnb stays and hotels um, as well as house sits and our visit home which are obviously free uh, so in 12 months uh, we've spent two thousand eight hundred and fifty three dollars in accommodation um, a note with that is uh, we worked out in the last four months uh, we spent nine nights in Airbnbs and hotels. Um, uh, basically, the nine nights were a few nights for Steph's birthday, a few nights for my birthday, and a few days here and there where the weather was just crap. So, nine nights in accommodation like that in the last four months cost us just under eleven $1 hundred dollars um ten thousand uh uh just under eleven $1 hundred dollars 
I think it was a thousand and seventy five dollars for those nine nights um, and that's included in that two thousand eight hundred figure so hypothetically had we not have done that because they were all un like not needed um, Airbnbs it was just to sort of treat ourselves I suppose um, we would have been under two thousand dollars in accommodation for a whole year that's crazy yeah and you know even with what we did spend the twenty eight hundred dollars um you know like if you're paying say three hundred dollars a week in rent or mortgage or something that amount like you're going to spend three thousand uh yeah you're going to spend three thousand dollars in 10 weeks in a house or 12 months traveling around australia so and admittedly we have had a few house sits which are free and we were home for that i think six week period um but really a lot of the caravan parks and stuff that we have stayed in were all not needed they were just we just felt like you know pulling into one either because we had to in around big cities and stuff there aren't that many free camps or just a good chance to do some washing and um you know charge the laptop up and stuff like that yeah so when you do put it into perspective like that when you do compare what you do pay to live in your home and then compare that to what that same money would get you traveling it yeah it's really a really interesting way to look at it and so we've rented our home out and obviously if you don't own a home then it's a bit different but usually you'd still be paying rent or something like that um, so yeah we were able to rent our home out and so they're basically paying our mortgage um, while we get to travel so yeah it's it's pretty cool really just how affordable it can be and like Chris said there was some house sits and stuff in there but there was also motels and Airbnbs so you could definitely do it cheaper than we have mm. um, and you could you could soak up more of those house sits and stuff like that there's been so many that we didn't do because they just weren't on the route we were going if we planned to meet people or whatever or um, we have a dog with us so if you didn't have a dog with you there'd be a lot more that you could apply for and get and that'd save you so much money and even on top of the amount that we've done you could do a lot more free camping um, some areas are way easier to free camp there's plenty to choose from and plenty of space um, as I said about capital cities and stuff um sometimes you just don't have a option but you don't have to go in and around those cities you can stay more outside and um take advantage of the free camps yeah exactly and they're they're the better spots anyway we find when we are sort of in those high touristy areas or really busy areas where a lot of the backpackers and um, tourists come to it's just not it's just not the vibe that we like it's just too many people all crammed into an area and you just don't have that space or peace and quiet and all right guys that's a bit of an update on where we're at now after 12 months of traveling full time uh we do want to thank everyone that's reached out and followed us along for these 12 months and even before that we we really appreciate everyone following along with our trip. Uh, we do have a bit of a Q&A to go through. We've got some questions from a few people following us that we're going to answer in a video. Um, so we'll put that one up next week for you um, just to separate it out a bit. Yep, so I think that's that's enough we've waffled on for a long time and hopefully we've given you a bit of insight into 
what it's been like for us and what the reality of it all is and mm -hmm. um yeah like chris said thank you very much and um yeah we'll see you in the next video hi guys uh on today's video no i'll just start again Weird. it's probably gonna cut your face off so Why? lean the other way away from your hand what do you mean what do you mean away from my hand? That way. I'm sure that will be all right. So just a really quick uh, overview of what we've done in the 12 months. Sorry. Scout! <laughs>